Hi, I'm Martha with our Brain Bank, and we are dedicated to moving glioblastoma from terminal to treatable, powered by patients. And today we have a special guest, Svia Bader of Trial Trajectory. I'm going to make her host now. She's going to share her screen, and she's going to talk about her amazing search engine for people looking to get onto clinical trials, and she'll also tell her personal story and her relationship to cancer and clinical trials also. So over to you, Tsvia. We are recording this. If no one, if you don't want your image to be seen, please um, just turn your, stop your video and go ahead and answer questions as we go along. We're a small group today, so we can um, keep it informal. Completely. So, hey, nice to meet you all. Really happy to be here with you guys. Um, so my name is Tsvia Bader. And the first time I kind of met uh, cancer, uh, from an intimate point of view is when I lost my mom in 98. Um, she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And her journey with cancer started by us meeting the oncologist who told us you should feel very lucky. We were afraid it's a uter we were afraid it's uterine uh, cancer. She has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, most there is a very known protocol majority of the patient responds to it so you'll have a terrible one year and then following that you can go back to your life and who knows better that you know with cancer no one should make those kind of statements and no one knows we all know where it starts we never know how it's going to end so she did not respond to treatment um and her cancer kept spreading as a non-solid cancer it kept spreading um they were we tried one protocol, it didn't work. We tried another protocol, it didn't work. At a certain point, her oncologist basically told me that we need to look uh, for clinical trial. That was the first time I've learned the, the concept of clinical trial. And I've asked why, and she said, well, this is an opportunity to find something that's not approved and might be able to work for you. And the reason she asked me to do so is because think about 98, those are the days internet just started. If you remember, we got connected using like the wire and you remember the AOL sound of the, uh, those days. And I was a geek already do, doing a lot of things with computer. So she basically asked me, she said, I, maybe you can look online and see if you find anything. And I started working on it and learning it. And it was complicated and, and hard. Um, and by the time I found something that she basically liked and I found a trial uh, for her, it was too late. And we lost my mom seven months after she got diagnosed. So she didn't even make it the one year mark. So that's my mom. That's when my first time. And then 14 years later, I find myself in a similar situation. I'm being diagnosed with malignant melanoma. So metastatic stage four. And I don't know how much you know about melanoma, but it's a little bit different these days, but very similar to GBM. At the time that I was diagnosed, there was no, it's a, it's a very, I, I received a very uh, active and uh, a non-responsive type of melanoma and there was no, melanoma does not respond to chemo. So, you know, the mortality rates were high and there was no approved protocol that was easy, um, easy to go with. Um, when I got the diagnosis, I started my journey in a community center. I live in New Jersey. Um, and I started my journey in, a, in one of the community, large community center in New Jersey. So I remember I started with the, with the uh, oncologist surgeon who did uh, three um, surgeries. And then basically referred me to continue treatment with the oncologist as soon as he found out it's metastasized uh, both to the lymph node and uh, into the liver. I met, I waited three hours and sounds familiar pre-COVID, right? In this waiting room, scared shitless. Um, I met this oncologist who came into the room, spent total, I think of five minutes with me more or less told me that it doesn't look too well, but he needs to make sure he didn't metastasize to the brain. So I must have a brain MRI first. Um, and following that, he'll see what he can do with me. And maybe there is one clinical trial that he can give me, but he's not sure yet. 
let's wait for the uh, MRI and then we can talk again. And I was sitting there and I was just like, and he was about to storm out and I was standing there. I was just like, what do you mean? There is only one. I'm not doing too well. That's not really encouraging, right? You, everyone told me my mom will do well and I lost her in seven uh, months. So like, you're telling me I'm not doing too well. I have three young girls at home. My youngest was one year old at the time and my oldest was five. So as you can imagine, I had a lot to fight for. And I was like, why clinical trials? Why not other option? What are you offering me? And he basically refused to talk to me and stormed out. I looked at my husband and said, okay, here, I'm not staying. So he will not see me again. He will not treat me again. And he looked at me and said, fine, but what do you want to do now? And I said, I don't know. I get it. I have cancer. I need to do something. I don't know yet what it is that I need to do. Let me go figure it out. Let me go start investigating and educating myself a little bit and see what's out there for me. So I did my research and, and one thing became clear that, you know, if I'm not going there, where do I want to go? Where do I want to get treated? So I'm lucky enough. I live by New York. I said, okay, there is Memorial Slow Catering in the city covered by my health insurance. Let's start with that. Let's first take myself to where it's a cancer research uh, institution. And, and let me start with that. And I thought, okay, awesome. Uh, now I have a better oncologist. This, I did my share. I can continue outsourcing and I'm hoping for the oncologist to come up with great solution for me, right? Um, and I met this really great oncologist. And he, when I first met him, he gave me three options all of a sudden. So not just one, I have three. And one of them was approved drugs. Two of them was in clinical trials. I was still trying to understand the role of clinical trials in all of it. And he basically educated me that in diseases that the approved drugs, and you guys have heard it before, is not working too well. Then the clinical trials offer a more innovative solution and basically a better promise. So I said, fine, I'm signing. Choose the one you think is best and let's kick it off, right? I need to start fighting, don't have time, TikTok. I started the first treatment, it lasted, I was on treatment, I think for six or seven months before the pets can show that the disease continued to spread. Um, and then we changed to the second option that we had. So the first one, just to start getting you used to the term was a targeted drug because I have a known mutation called BRAF and started with a targeted drug that didn't work. The second one was a combination of uh, approved immunotherapy, uh, PDL1, Keytruda, if you heard, and, uh, and a virus uh, vaccination, TVAC. So it's a combo of immunotherapy. We can dive into more of the logic behind it later. Uh, which made a lot of sense. And I said, let's go with it. And we started. And it worked for a little bit. And I felt like, okay, I'm on top of it. I got it. Scan looked good. Disease seemed to respond to treatment. Um, I completed the protocol. And uh, we took a few months of me ba basically going back to living my life and taking care of the girls. And it was around 12 months after I started treatment, um, or I don't know, three or four months after I, I, I ended the treatment that uh, pets can show recurrence. And again, as with recurrence, they always come back with advantage. I always say that they say that they, your dog, you know, owners of dog, I have two dogs, you end up looking a little bit like your dog. I think there is also characteristic uh, with the cancer, right? I'm stubborn in this hell, and apparently so is my cancer. And uh, but when when it came back again, I was just like, okay, stop. I, I need to do something different here. And and I asked my oncologist a very simple question. I asked, now that we need to choose another treatment and see, and and if I want to improve my odds, what you're offering me is the best out of everything out there. Maybe I should have asked it all along, or is it just what's in Memorial? Is it just what you were working on? I was trying to understand like, how's decision being made for me? And, and I found very quickly that, and he was very honest. He said, I'm, I'm only offering you what's in, only what's in Memorial and also what I'm involved with. 
works. So you realize that your oncologist is offering you a subset of all the possibilities out there. And it's not enough, right? I, I want to make sure that I'm getting the best out of the best. I, I want to make sure that all options are open. May maybe then I'll decide not to because it's too far away. Maybe I'll decide not to because you know the side effects are too much for me for whatever reason. But I need to have the choice and the understanding of what are the options first. And at that point, um, I, I started to change my, the way I operated. And I started to really deep dive and try to understand and learn what treatment option exists, what clinical trials exist, what are the research showing what works and doesn't work and what's the logic behind it to the limit that I can, right? Because I'm not a doctor. Like I, I don't completely understand those terms. I've never went to a med school, didn't even study biology. Um, so as I was struggling to kind of getting ownership over my journey and understanding like my treatment option and to do all of that with, you know, while we're being sick with cancer and, and, and mentally stressed and scared, I got introduced to someone who's now actually my partner who, who does, uh, who did cancer research in NYU and basically told her, can you help me? Can you help me understand what everything that is out there and understand my option and understand how to compare between options and explain it to me in a language that I understand, not that the oncologist understands. So then I can count, go back to my oncologist and evaluate the, what, what's the option on the table and, and, and make sense of them all. And she did it for me. And, and I came back to the meeting with the oncologist and basically there was a couple of options there and on the table. And then just so you guys will understand how much this, even the best oncologist, and again, he's the best oncologist. I love him to pieces. I, I'm still with him, but like I off, I, he was off giving me three options. And then I was just like sharing with him this option that we found together. And he started to kind of move uncomfortably with it. And, and it was not even in another hospital. Like I, it was there and I was asking, why aren't you even offering me this? What's wrong with this option? And he looked at it and then looked at me and say, to be honest, I don't have any seat left for this trial. So if you're going on a trial, I'd rather you're going on another. I was just like, really? Just because you filled up your quota, I should be walk away from something that could be good for me. Like, but, but it is what it is. The system has their own driver and agenda and, and they're trying to do best for us, but also what's best for them. So the, the more important discussion ended up that I found a very um, an aggressive treatment that combined chemo infusion in a surgery. So you can basically infuse chemo directly into the body, not going through your vein, your external vein, which means you can in, introduce this way a much larger quantity quantity of chemo. Uh, and then you and you create a very and then you kind of wash the wash the area of the tumors with the with the chemo and then you, they wash it out a little bit and then they start introducing immunotherapy so the body will continue fighting the disease now that it's in a, you put the body in a state of emergency it's a very aggressive type of treatment again it was on a trial um my oncologist just checking time my oncologist was not very certain about it he felt that it's very aggressive treatment and maybe we should wait with it start with something else, another combo of immunotherapy. And that, that doesn't work, keep something more aggressive that we will have in case, treat, if, in case tumor will not respond. But I, had, but I felt differently. I understood his logic, but I felt like I need to, you know, in another treatment or so, if it fails, will I be strong enough to do it? Uh, not sure. And also if I can do something aggressive now and end or put my, get myself into remission, better for me now, I, I gain more time. Again, that was me. I felt like I'm strong enough, have high tolerance of pain, and that's what I've decided to do. What's important is it's not that decision to go aggressive or not aggressive. What, the reason I'm telling you that is to say that when you have options, there is a lot of things that can also can come into consideration. How, how much you can tolerate pain, what type of treatment you want. You, can, you make decisions that are right for you as a patient rather than just you know, whatever, rather than being in a lane, in a lane that, that has little or less options. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, and so far, knock on wood, I been semi sort of clean. So that was uh, three and a half years ago. 
Uh, and by sort of clean, I can only say that in, in when I'm a, among groups of cancer patients, because you never really, right? So I had a little a little thing that they found here and they took it out in the surgery. And then I had a little tumor here that they take out in surgery, but overall I'm doing really well. Uh, I'm living and kicking ass and I'm, and, um, and I see myself as in, 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 in doing really well under that assumption and being, you know, under the scans every three months to clean what's not need to be there and, and continue until the next one, right? Living from a scan to a scan. So that's, the, that's my story. Out of this came the really clear realization for me at least that we as patient needs better tools to manage our journey. That, that if I compare my journey to my mom's journey, two things, fundamental things have changed and one have not. Two fundamental things have changed is A, there's definitely more treatment option out there. Maybe I have a slide about it yet. Many, many more treatment options out there, a lot more. A lot of them are not yet at stable state. So a lot of them not necessarily being approved. They are in clinical trial stages, but they're get, but they definitely great option out there and, and yielding better results for patients. And that's, by the way, why the NCCN now recommend clinical trial as best management for majority of the indication. And there's a lot of research done that show better outcome to patients in clinical trial versus the standard of care. And it's a combination of the better, newer drugs with the fact that you get better. Also, let's admit it, you get better care when you're in clinical trials because the pharma has vested interest in getting you tested all the time and, and paying attention to any reporting that you're doing about side effects or any kind of issue. Um, so that's so there's definitely more treatment option than ever, ever before. There's a lot more knowledge and, and ways to us to for us as patient to educate ourselves and, and understand our disease and, and organization uh, like our brain bank and where we are right now is a, 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 a perfect example. Resources to support patient, to educate patient was not there to begin with when my mom was diagnosed. But what has not changed enough is that we're still 100% outsourcing the decision to our oncologist because they're our main source of information. We're not medical professional. The, New treatment has, as great as they are, are very complex in terms of matching patient to a treatment because the more precise they are, they call it now precision medicine or personalized medicine, right? They're, each treatment is designed for a very specific profile of a patient. So, and therefore the matching of a patient to a drug becomes kind of a form of art. And that's by the way, one of the biggest problems for also the oncologists. It's not that they, don't intend to do well, or they cannot keep up with the amount of treatment option and with the complexity of it. And, and they don't have the time to do this investigation for each one of us and then think about all the possible options. And out of realizing that as a techie, okay, so I've been in the tech industry all those years, I felt like it's we can use technology to help resolve it. And if you think about technology and like, Think about kayak or booking.com, right? Who use a travel agent anymore? You'll go there and you'll see your all your all your flight option. And then maybe you use a travel agent to consult with and give you advice what's the best way to design a trip to Disney. This is my last trip. I took my girls to Disney. But I'm not, but I I I talked to him because I trust his expertise. I don't need him to tell me all the options. I saw it already. Um, and I also bring in more ideas that I found or better prices so we, he can help me discuss it. So that's kind of what was the concept behind trajectory. I, I went and met with the lady that I told you that the cancer researcher that, uh, that helped me navigate through it. And I said, can I take your brain and build a machine that thinks and know the same way, but better, a machine that can read through all the treatment protocol, apply all this, all this logic and medical understanding that you have. So understanding of the medical terms, understanding of the medical logic, what should come first, where should you start, what's a better option than another, apply it to a machine, and then basically give every patient the option to see all his options and partner with his oncologist in, in making those decisions. Oh, that's my ugly face again, sorry. Uh, and make those decisions. So that's kind of the story behind trajectory. So 
we, we truly believe in, in your treatment, your decision, your journey. And we build a platform that, first of all, is free for patients, okay? That's the first thing. Like, we don't, like, you don't need additional costs attached to it or talk to another expert. What we do is make it simple. We build the artificial intelligence engine that connects to the FDA database, reads through all those protocols. And like I said, it mimics the mind of my partner. So he knows how to read those protocols. And basically a patient's come in, he builds his profile. So how does he build the profiles? He go through a questionnaire that takes, I'll say six minutes to build that we ask about uh, disease characteristic, what stage, where is it located, uh, biomarkers or any information that patients know. We ask about treatment history and outcome. We ask about overall health. So it takes you through and ask you a different question that is needed. At the end of this process, you're actually being matched to clinical trials that, that match your uh, medical condition. So think about it. From in five minutes, you see all your clinical trials options. Two things I want to say about it. A, it's a starting point, right? That's not, um, that's the point where you now take this information and you start digesting it. So we show you the clinical trials, but we also show you what other patients treatment, what other patients, what type of treatment they received and what was the outcome for that. So not in a personal kind of way, they identify, of course, but we are giving you the options us, me as well, to see all treatment options. Here's the clinical trials that are right for me. Here are the drugs that others with the exact condition like me took. This is what happened to them with it. Those that got into remission, those that had toxicity, those that had disease recurrence. I think, you know, with GBM, there is less treatment that are approved right now, but it still gives you a lot of data points to start understanding. Like when you, when you talk to your oncologist, you start to see and understand, okay, you're offering this drug, but actually what is the success rate with it? What's the risk of toxicity, any side effects? So we're, there's a lot of data there. In terms, of the, in terms of matching to the clinical trial. So when we first did it, I felt like, awesome. We did what takes a doctor like, you know, two days to do, we do it in five minutes. But we realized that it's not enough. If, if I'm as a patient needs to make a decision, I need more than that. So we do two things with it. One, from the platform perspective, we organize it based on priority, meaning combo, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about GBM logic, combo better than, than mono, targeted better than wide treatment. And the other thing is, more importantly, is there is a support team of the Avita, of my partners of the world, of PhD cancer research that are there to help you understand your option. Now, they're not replacing the oncologist. This list should are, are being sent by email and can be for you to share with your oncologist. There is also a link that you can actually email it directly to your oncologist, or if you trust your oncologist, if not, then we can you can find second opinion. The idea is not to give you medical advice, but there is a team there that is there to help you understand this option, okay? That you can ask, I didn't, or there was something in the questionnaire I couldn't say there is this going on with me, or I'm looking at this trial, what does it mean? What, what is this drug? Was it uh, tested before? Maybe on another indication. Give you all the background, get you comfortable and understand in understanding it. And then, like I said, go to doc, to your oncologist if you trust them to make this decision. Or if you want to go and meet with the trial investigator, the investigator is the oncologist specialized in, in GBM in the site where they're running the trial. You want to go meet with them and ask him more questions and learn more about the trials, the drugs, the logic we help you set up this meeting. So basically we're virtually holding the hands of the patient until you're safely placed and in treatment. Um, and that's key for us because one of the things we realized you cannot do everything and I can't believe it's a techie I said, but you can't do everything without talking to necessarily talking to someone or having someone out there to know, know that he can help you and guide you through. Um, so that's a really big part of what we do. Um, and I think GBM is a close topic to heart because my, the, my partner, the one I told you about that helped me navigate through my journey, as we were, she was helping me, she lost her mom to GBM. So 
it's a it's a close to home kind of topic. And I thought maybe if you would like, Marla, she can come and actually talk about the clinical research and, and the effort done right now in a lay person format uh, for the GBM. But one of the things that, you know, I've asked her to prepare for us today is like, talk a little bit why clinical research offer new hope for GBM patient. Because I think like melanoma, uh, the response to currently approved treatment is, is limited, right? It's not, there are some diseases that are responding very well to some of the, uh, the treatment out there and some that are not responding very well. And she listed here the reason, I think you probably guys are familiar wh why the drug's not necessarily working as well. Uh, and, and the resistance that is, uh, that is uh, created and the evasion of the immune uh, surveillance. And I think those are all things that are familiar with. What's interesting is to see what's going on in the clinical trials, because the, the, the therapeutic approach that are, they are looking is, is to do two things, A, overcome the resistance and B, amplify the immune system. So it's very similar to the melanoma, right? How can we amplify the immune system to better fight uh, to better fight the, the tumor. And, and in a way where, there ha where the promises is right now with the GBM trial is actually on the, um, on the combinational approach. And if you guys remember what I told you about my journey, it's very much similar to where they ended up in the melanoma. So the melanoma never responded to any of the standard of care, not, not in any significant way. Uh, and then they started with mono treatment, so one type of treatment, immunotherapy is one type or, or even uh, targeted as one. And what they've realized over the past five or four years, and the same goes to GBM, that actually a multi, uh, a combinational approach with a multimodal approach actually works better. So whether it's immunotherapy combo or a device with a drugs combo, or radiation with a targeted molecular combo. So those are kind of the trials that are now showing great promise and, and providing and reporting on, on great outcome on the GBM. So very, there are similarities to what we've, we've seen in, in melanoma. And I think that's why I believe that, you know, there is no promise on clinical trials, right? But we, we, we tend to forget that there is no promise on the approved drugs either. That's not a hundred percent. It doesn't work not, unfortunately, not even for 60 or 80%. And, and I think what's important to me is not if someone apply to a clinical trial or not, is to know the option, is to take clinical, take, see all your options, approved drugs, clinical trials, repurposed drugs, so as a patient, you need to make sure that you see all your options and then you make the best decision for you based on what's, like, what's right for you. You feel more comfortable with one line of treatment, excellent. But you made that choice out of an option and not as a default because, and it seems like it's, that's the only ones that, the only things that is out there. I spoke a lot, I apologize. No, it's great, Dia. It's it's so interesting, and you're so passionate about it. Um, I had a couple of thoughts. One is the, um, you know, we work with we have medical advisors, and they're oncologists, neuro oncologists, neurosurgeons, and they've told us very. I mean, it kind of depends what kind of hospital you're at. If you're at a for profit or non profit, but even the non profit ones, they want to keep. It's in their best interest to keep the patient there. And so, you know, uh, one doctor told me that he got pushback from the administration saying, you can't be telling this person to go get treated somewhere else, to go get a second opinion. You can't do that. You're losing business for us. You know, and I hear that kind of thing and it, I find it just shocking and appalling, but you know, it, it happens every day, you know, it's, it's every day. It is what it is. It's a business for them. I, I read somewhere that every cancer patient now it's scary to think of us as this, but worth like between two to $5 million to a hospital insane but that's the reality so they cannot do what they want and and they put our best interest first but there is other consideration that come into play now if we will come to your oncologist and tell them look i've seen this trial or i've seen that option it's not running here it's somewhere else but he's not going to tell you it's not a good option if you believe you know medically that it is a good option 
but he will not offer it to you. And that's why we have the responsibility to know about it and then, and then follow it up. Exactly. Did you read, um, I, I think I sent you the survey we did um, year before last for GBM Awareness Day about clinical trials. And we asked people, you know, did your doctor tell you about clinical trials? Did your doctor direct you to information about them? You know, and most people just, they no. either, either it didn't come up or if it did come up, they would like in your situation, if I understood that correctly, they only wanted to offer you the one that that researcher was either involved with or at that treatment center. Exactly. You know, they didn't want you to go somewhere else. But this is only the US, right? I think, I mean, I hope in other places it's, but the thing, it's, 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 it's interesting. Great. The US has many more clinical trials, if I'm not wrong, than any other country in the world, yet, you know, Lower our number of, yeah. It's like, so messed up that you don't even know about them. Exactly, it's only, it's crazy. So A, rest assured, in, every, in all the developed countries where there is, uh, there is money involved and ego involved, it's the same situation, unfortunately. Um, and, and B, yeah, the U.S. has the most opportunities to patient because the most clinical trials, uh, all of them end up here, majority of, or almost all of them, especially on oncology. And yet only two to 4% of the patients end up in, in clinical trials. And you know what's upsetting? You know, 70% of, of us, of cancer patients are being treated in the community setting. Uh, and only 10% and exactly what you said in your survey are presenting it as an option. And if you'll go to one of the top research institution, the first thing they'll offer you is clinical trial before major, if they have one that fits for you. So, so they see it as a better option for you, but only if they have one for you. So if they don't, all of a sudden it's not the best, it's not in the area agenda to present it as a care option. Um, Svia, do you have more of your presentation or should we? No, no, no. Question, question. Okay. Actually, why don't you, can you stop the share? Yes, sorry. I didn't I apologize. Uh, oh, it's okay. Don't worry. Um, you know, this is personal to me because my my mother-in-law, who I never met, she, uh, she died at age 42 when my husband was 17 of melanoma. And it was just, I think there were just so few, this is back in the 70s, and there were just not the treatment options that there are today. No, and even look, when I, even I compare when I got diagnosed, so I got diagnosed in 2013 uh, to where we are today. It's, it's a completely different story and it's all because of the new research and the focus that was done on that. It's, and it's, 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 when I got diagnosed with the metastatic melanoma, you know, the survival rates were, was between 40 and, and 30%. Now I think it swapped, so because of the new drugs. That's great. But, uh, also, people, I don't think people don't know, um, you know, musician Bob Marley, people think, I kind of had a vague idea he died of brain cancer, but he died of melanoma. And that's right to the brain, yeah. It wasn't diagnosed because, and this often happens with, with African-Americans, who are African-Americans, Black, but whatever, uh, he, it was on his toe, and he just, just said, oh, some weird thing on my toe, you know, and then and then before he knew it, it spread to his brain. Yeah, and mine was not even sun related. I have a, what's called BRAF mutation. So there was no visible sign on the skin. Oh, wow. So, you know, it is what it is. Great, well, we've been telling our community, we put it on our web, we put the trial trajectory on our website and we've been telling our community um, I checked it out myself just as a test, and I was really impressed with the questions were so, you could tell they were just very carefully thought out, and um, it, I was very impressed by it. Oh, you have a question, Elizabeth? Uh, well, first, once again, thank you all for doing these series. I find them very helpful and for... Um, you know, for, for our family's journey on this, uh, this has been a wonderful guide and I appreciate it. But um, my background and my discipline is law. I have very limited knowledge about medicine. Unfortunately, due to my mother's diagnosis, I've had to kind, yeah. of, kind of work on that and get, get smarter on that. But th the questions that I would have, I do have familiarity with working through databases and, and things of that nature, but um, does the program account for situations where you may want to continue adjunct therapies like 
um, off-label drugs where it could still tell you where you might be eligible for a clinical trial, even if you want to continue with off-label drugs. Um, that, that would be my concern is in a clinical trial, would my mom have to stop all the other treatments in order to participate? Do, does the program have a, a feature that might account for that? Or would that be the stage where you'd have to go out and communicate with directly with the people doing the trial to find that out? So it really depends on the protocol of the trial. So if the trial okay. specify that you need to stop it and you're on it, we will let it, you'll know it. And okay. some trials will let you do parallel. Majority of them, if it's a direct treatment uh, to the cancer, will ask to stop, but not necessarily, depends again on the treatment and the protocol. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and so not necessarily it. assume that the computer program is going to weed it out. You would have Ex to go and exactly. communicate with them. Okay. So if you think about okay. it, each trial kind of each protocol as the pharmaceutical company get it approved by the FDA has a list of what we call eligibility criteria. So basically it's like usually around 40 to 50 list of, of things that need the patient needs to have or not needs to have needs to do or not needs to do. So what the, the, what's the, the, the engine does, it's based on the information you gave us, we it compare it to what they're right, are asking you to do or not to do, and then let you know whether it, it makes sense or not makes sense. And then if there is additional things, like I mentioned, there is always someone you can ask if it was listed in the eligibility or is it a barrier or not. If our team can mm -hmm. answer that, we will. If not, then, then the oncologist site will let you know, but maybe then... If you say no, you you can communicate what's the risk or what's the issue you're seeing, and then seeing if there what maybe he can give you another compromise or maybe he can offer his point of view. So I think the dialogue is always worth having, and you're not losing anything by having the dialogue. It doesn't force you then to make a decision immediately. Right, right, and and does the program factor in age? as part of those parameters to tell you what you're eligible for? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful. And the, the other thing in terms of clinical trials at other locations, I guess they, the other locations, if it's like not in the city or the state where you live, I guess it's just a matter of whether or not you can get there for the frequency needed to participate. So it would probably be on a case by case basis if you're looking at something out of state. Exactly. Then, then, then we can figure out how frequent you actually need to be there. And also sometimes from a cost perspective, the pharmaceutical company are willing to cover your travel costs. So even like lodging and flying or driving, they'll, the majority of the time they'll cover those additional costs. So as a patient, you don't have to bear them. Interestingly, now post COVID, there is more and more openness in the pharmaceutical company to actually either do some of the things to bring the trials closer to the patient. Now they say it, <laughs> I still need to see it being maintained, but the practicality of it means that, you know, if it's not a device or, or a surgery or something that needs to be taken in a specific site, maybe the blood works, or maybe if it's an IV of an approved drug, you can get it in a clinic next to home, and then they transfer the data to the main hospital, and you only go there if it's out of state, when you need for a specific follow-up or, or for a specific procedure that can only be done there, and that, that removes a lot of the barriers. Um, other thing that we're pushing the pharma to do is instead of selecting site hospital you work with and then hoping the patient to come to them, let's find the patients that are right and willing. And then you select a site that is close to the patient. They call this model just in time, where basically you were saying the patients are a customer. So let's kick it off by them and where they are and what they need and not the other way around. Um, so there is more willingness and openness among some of the pharmaceutical company for models like that. I think hopefully with time and as you know, not nonprofit organization like this and others and us will continue pushing them. We will see more and more of 
more and more of that. And instead of us having to chase the trials, they'll come closer to us and will ease our life a little bit. So yeah, that's so interesting. So how, how is that coordinated though? I mean, how do you, yeah. is there a question? <laughs> like how do, we them? how do we, not we, I, I'm not a GBM patient myself, but how does the GBM community reach out and say, look, there's a bunch of us here in you know, Ohio or wherever. So that's what we're trying to do with the trajectory platform on the pharma side is basically flag patients that are fit to those trials, right? Uh, and, 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 and basically reach out to the sponsors and say, you don't have any site in Columbus, Ohio. The nearest one is like in another state, it's like 300, 500 miles far away. Why won't you open one close to the patient here? Um, it's in the best interest of everybody and, and make it easy for them. But Think about not- silly thing. Like also today, like I used to travel to Manhattan cause I, I live in New Jersey. So to just receive the package of drugs that could easily be delivered, right? I used to, so I, like three hours, once a week, driving to the pharma, to this pharmaceutical to get, cause it's only in the hospital pharmace- pharmacy that I could have done those drugs because they were part of a trial, drive home just to pick them up, right? So- Wait, wait, why couldn't they just FedEx them to you or something? You would think so, but that's not the way they operate. They were never thinking about like our journey and like what's the barrier. And that's part of what we as trial director are trying to sort of like educate the the pharmaceutical company to understand the barriers for a patient, um, to understand also, like you just said, I'm not applying to this trial because it will force me to stop these drugs, which I know already have an effect. So we're communicating it back to the pharma, they identify, but like pushing back the pharma or some of the trials have so many, like you have to come and have blood draw three times a week. So we're pushing back and saying, most patients are saying it's too much. Can you reduce it? Can you consolidate visit? Can you do it close to home? Or even if that's so important to the trial, can you send a nurse home and do it in the patient home instead of having him have to drag himself three times a week to a hospital and, and to get tested. So part of our mission is on, on the patient side is to give us option. On the pharma side is to bring back the patient voice and needs and push them to accommodate more to the patient um, and not just for the hospitals and the, and the doctor's need, but to our need as well. Right. And I think if I recall correctly, when you fill out, there's a big questionnaire you do when you, when you join trial, trial trajectory and that some of the questions are, you know, how far are you willing to travel and you know, where do you live? How far are you willing to travel? Um, and there also, there are nonprofits who can, um, you know, like the, um, uh, national brain tumor society, they have navigators or end brain cancer, and they can help you with things like get free or discounted um lodging if you if you do have to travel so there are people out there that will help you completely you know because it's like like, like traveling to new york and staying in a hotel is is very expensive i know it is so there is non-profit and we also work now with cancer care which is a non-profit that has and we also push the pharma to pay a lot of those expenses so we try to do remove and as many barriers as there is around around this Hey, Kip, did you have any thoughts? Uh, not immediately, but thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Kip. Any other question or thoughts? We have you, a friend. You would kind of, oh, go ahead, go ahead. We have a friend who lives in Maine. And he comes to Houston <laughs> for treatments. Really? Yeah, yeah, but you do what you have to do, right? So if there is something good, there, there's no reason not to. I was willing when I was doing my research. I was willing to travel everywhere, anywhere. Yeah. Um, you, you had touched on this some already in terms of cost and saying sometimes the pharmaceutical companies will bear some of the cost. I assume that when you approach a clinical trial, that that's something you have to put out there right away. Is what kind of cost am I looking at for myself? And and I and and I'm kind of asking and I'm kind of presuming I would think once you get to the point of clinical trials, you're not looking at insurance company coverage anymore. 
and, so and no, that's a per no 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 so you're still under your so the good thing about clinical trial a you're still under the health insurance they're not kicking you out but all the the pharma covers all the cost of the drugs so you don't need to even participate in the cost of the drugs uh, they cover all the drug costs and all the additional testing that are required for the purpose of the trial they cover so what you're left with is any out of pocket that you would have normally, nothing other than that. And like, I've, and if like travel, et cetera, lodging, et cetera. And like, we, like I've mentioned, there is a lot of programs from the pharmaceutical side and others to help cover the additional costs, et cetera. They're not allowed to pay for participation. They're not allowed to cover all costs out of the gate because they're not, they need to make sure that they don't give financial incentive to patient to participate, which I think is so ridiculous when it comes to oncology. Really, do you think that that for like you covering my uh, copay of a hundred dollars, that's what's gonna give me an incentive to take a drug that for my cancer? Yeah, that, that's how much they understand uh, what drives us. But, but, uh, but yes, there are ways and, and there's via nonprofit, et cetera, to mitigate all costs. But what, one of the things I think I've mentioned in the beginning, there was a huge research done on, I think, 12 million uh, records of patients, cancer patients, different indications, that they analyzed the outcomes for patients who were in standard of care versus those that were in clinical trials. And, and what they've seen is that those on clinical trials had better outcomes. Uh, and they listed the two reasons why, like I mentioned, the new drugs, New generation, right? It's iPhone 5 versus iPhone, what are we at now? 11 or 12, new generation, more effective. But B, it's also the quality of the care. Because, because it's not just left for your insurance that will try to make sure you get as minimum testing and follow-up as possible. The pharma has the opposite agenda to give you as many follow-ups and testing so they, they'll know exactly what's going on. Uh, and then if you're not responding to, to the treatment, you actually know it fairly you know, you catch it on early when the, if um, the disease stop responding and then you can change treatment fairly quickly. So, and, and we know the time is a huge factor in our disease. So, so that's part of, uh, part of the reason it's a better outcome for patients. Um, Tavia, you mentioned earlier that, that reading from the FDA database now, is that the same as clinicaltrials.gov? That's exactly clinicaltrials.gov. It's two, it's clinicaltrials.gov. So our, like our machine, I refer to her as a she because she's smart, a connect to it. But the, that and, and NCI has their own database, which is more or less overlapping, but we connect there as well. And then when we have a relationship with the pharma, we get additional information from them. But regardless of whether we have a relationship with the pharma or not, unlike hospital or any of the website that you see sometimes which are actually trap and advertisements of pharma you will patient will see all their options that are listed so clinicaltrials.gov is basically once the trial is being submitted for the fda approval it has to be published there uh, by law and then the status as it changed needs to be updated there and and be transparent to us as patients right but does every country, I mean, outside the US, they have their own equivalent of the FDA, correct? Correct, but every drug's being developed, everybody wants to get approval in the US. So they yeah. have to yeah. submit it to the FDA because this, we're the biggest market for cancer. Uh, I've definitely seen, I've seen many countries outside the US that have, that have trials, not in GBM, First, not so many in GBM, but I know less in GBM. Yes, but a lot of them basically are in the U.S. and in Europe or Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are very few drugs that will go first, get approval, and at another institution, and then go to the FDA. Even the European uh, authority that is called Nice uh, that are approving new treatment all usually follow the FDA because the FDA, and I think you've seen it unlike unrelated to cancer also when it came to COVID. So they followed, the, the developed countries follow the FDA guidelines and approval. They prefer it because the FDA methodology and, and the measurements are very strict and, uh, and, and therefore yield very gr good outcome in, in terms of accuracy. Right. Oh, I have one more question. I know we're getting on to 
the hour. Um, do you, are you, maybe this is outside of your purview, but are you, I know in sometimes in clinical trials, it will be deemed, you know, a failure and then that's it, you're done. But there might be a subset of people who responded really well to the treatment. And, and you know, where is that information going? You know, that information should be getting out there to that, that subset of people, to them individually, but also just to researchers overall. So the, so yeah, it's, it's a big, so it's out of, out of scope for trajectory, but yeah, there's a lot of discussion around that. So what is being discussed on, on the cancer side of it is A, because, you know, like we said, even if it's a successful, there was a lot of people I didn't work for because we are all so individually different. And then the other way around as you presented. So A, those that it works for them, of course, no. And then there is a commitment from the pharmaceutical company to continue uh, continue producing the drugs for them as well. Because one of the things is if it's working for you, even if the overall statistic is not good, they're not going to move forward with maybe with commercialization of it. You don't want to stop it for a patient who have obviously been responsive to it, responding to it. So they have a commitment to continue the, uh, producing the drugs and delivering the drugs as long as the patient is on it and responding to it, which is awesome. But, but I mean, that is, yes, that is awesome. But are they sharing that data? Are they- They're starting to share the data. So the data is shared. Everything needs to be published. That's part of the FDA. So in clinicaltrials.gov, there is a completely different section of them having to report the outcomes and what works and what doesn't. And because there is so much that invested in research, then this data is being analyzed to see it didn't work. People have not responded. So is it a dosage thing? Is it a combination kind of thing? Would it work on a specific subset? What's the similarity of those that have responded? Um, what is those specific mutation biomarkers, treatment history, you know, other health? What, what are those parameters that made it being effective for a specific group versus the other? So they, they continue to investigate it because we are all responding very differently to the treatments and there is no one size fit all. And I think the industry recognize it and that's where they're going. There's not gonna be any more like just an approved protocol for every stage three GBM. There, there is gonna be a lot more treatment option based on a lot more factors that comes in. Uh, any other thoughts, question before I dash off? If anybody needs anything, regardless, you want to, so my email is sviatrajectory.com, but if you have a question or you want to talk to the real expert, which is not me, which is the clinical team and have someone there that specializes on GBM and have you review your option, give you some additional information on a specific thing, just feel free to reach out. Okay, don't, don't be shy. And, and that's the, that's the reason we exist, right? It's not, it's a company and everything. And it's not it's pro profit, but it, it, the mission is one: is to help patients and help and and save lives. So whatever you need, we'll, we'll do our best to help. Oh, great! Thank you. That's so kind. Yeah, I was very impressed by that. I mean, answering the questions was really quick, and then I just got you know these emails that were just super helpful, and they were very friendly, and you know they I just was very impressed by the whole thing. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. And um, we, will, we will be in touch and come back uh, next Tuesday. We have another um, guest speaker and that should be very interesting. So it's always the second Tuesday of each month. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Bye guys.